In Germanium, uh, we can do single qubit gates on single spins by uh, EDSR. Um, but we also want to do multi qubit gates. For example, we may want to do a two qubit gates uh, between two qubits. Uh, we may also want to couple more qubits. Then we want to combine these single and multi qubit operations to form a quantum algorithm. In the end, of course, to aim to for a practical uh, quantum algorithm. Here we will cover the aspect from going from two qubit gates to quantum algorithms with some perspective on the quantum simulation. But first of all, how can we do a two qubit gate? Here you see a picture of a two by two germanium qubit system, um, where in this case you see the red qubit depicted in the right on the top that may have possible interactions with the other three qubits. In the case that there's no coupling or there's no exchange interaction with the other qubits, we have a single resonance frequency. That means the resonance frequency is not dependent on the other qubits. Once we start to increase the exchange interaction with one of the other qubits, what we're observing is a splitting of the resonance frequency. And this means that the resonance frequency or the energy separation of the qubit state is dependent on the qubit state of the other qubits. And so here we see some fascinating observation that if we start to increase more and more these couplings to other qubits, we see a further and further splitting. For example, in the end, we may have um, an, a splitting into um, eight states for all these different possibilities. Now, in going from left to right, if there's no coupling to the other qubits, uh, we can still do a qubit operation. This will be a single qubit gate. Right? We can manipulate the qubit from spin down to up, perform a, uh, uh, put the qubit into a coherent state. Um, we can also uh, do a two qubit gate. For example, we can rotate one qubit dependent on the state of the other qubit. For example, if the other qubit is in spin down state, we can only rotate that qubit if we apply the correct resonance frequency. If it's in the up state, we need to apply another resonance frequency. So we can do a conditional operation. This is called the C rot. If we have two exchanges on, then this will become a conditional conditional rotation, CC rot. And finally, a CC C rot gate. So in germanium, we can uh, study this uh, as you observe here. So for example, this is the um, resonance frequency of an individual qubit without any exchange interaction with any nearby uh, qubits. Then if we apply uh, a voltage pulse on one of the barriers uh, to, the to the other qubits, we can change the potential landscape and we can increase the coupling between the qubits. For example, here we pulse on one barrier and we see a splitting in the resonance frequency. And so this will be a C-rod gate. We can do this again and we see a further splitting. We can do this again and we see a further splitting again. So that means that we now have the option to go from a one qubit gate to a two qubit gate to a three qubit gate to a four qubit gate. To put this into context, if we want to execute a large quantum algorithm, we may want to do all kinds of gates. We may also want to couple all kinds of qubits. So high qubit connectivity is relevant. But also, we may want to do an operation that, okay, dependent on the state of this qubit, these two qubits should do something, and then that qubit should do something. So the ability to execute uh, a multi-qubit gate may be highly advantage. advantage. At the same time, as you can envision here, that the dependence on the noise is increasing or at least it may increase. Because if we have multiple voltages that we need to carefully tune to have a certain splitting, if one of those is changing, we may, want, or we may make an error because the resonance frequency is not exactly as we want it to be. In addition, um, the type of multi-qubit gate may be rather complicated. So indeed, we have a certain resonance frequency here, but in doing so, we may also um, end up with an additional 
one, two, or three cubed gates. So depending on the algorithm and depending on the environment, it may be better to either use a combination of one and two qubit gates to perform a quantum algorithm, or perhaps even a multi-qubit gate. This may depend on the desire to keep the quantum state on the other quantum state, or the desire to still measure the state of the other quantum state. And these considerations need to take into account in mapping a quantum algorithm and compiling it to execute it on a real uh, Germanian qubit system. So the two qubit gates can be done by doing a controlled rotation. So this is actively driving the qubit. This is perhaps not the best way of doing it. First of all, it's not maybe not the fastest way of doing it because the speed of the operation is determined by how fast one can drive the qubit. Secondly, driving the qubit uh, may also lead to imperfections. For example, the driving may excite traps and other uh, states of the system, giving rise to decoherence. Um, and third, there needs to be a good combination between the pulse to turn on the exchange as well as the rotation of the qubit. However, there are also variants uh, of doing two qubit gates, and a particular one is the C phase gate, CZ gate here. The way we do this is just by simply turning on the exchange interaction. So, what will this do? If we look at it from a single qubit perspective, by turning on the exchange interaction, we're changing the resonance frequency. And this change in resonance frequency will cause phase evolution in time. But this change in resonance frequency is dependent on the state of the other qubit. So we get an evolution of the phase in time, which is dependent on the state of the other qubit. And so by carefully timing um, now this phase evolution, we can map it out to perform a C phase gate, as you see in the algorithm here. And we can do this for all the possible combinations. Now a C phase gate together with a single qubit control defines a universal gate set. So with these, we can also implement a quantum algorithm. And here you see an example uh, where in this sequence, we start to entangle all qubits and then disentangle all qubits. And so at the bottom, you see the measurements uh, connecting to this circuit. In particular, you see that in the beginning, all the qubits are uh, disentangled from each other. And so if we apply a Rabi rotation on the qubit three in this case, we observe that uh, in the measurement. If we then start to couple the different qubits, we first start to see like, okay, this, this uh, evolution, oscillation is also starting to appear in the other qubit. Whereas in the middle of the sequence feel like it seems to be almost gone. Of course, there's still quite some significant noise. So, you know, to really make this useful, you should do quite a bit better, but still it's, you can see a rather flat line, uh, which is, to expect if, if all qubits are entangled with each other, because if we then measure them, we obtain no information because we don't have sufficient measurement to extract all the information. Yeah. If we then continue the argument by disentangling the qubits, we start to observe the oscillations back again. In particular, at the end, we retrieve our original operation uh, back, uh, demonstrating that we entangled and disentangled then the entire array showcasing that we can execute a quantum algorithm. To take it a step further, we can um, study whether we can execute error correction with quantum dot qubits. So this is a crucial part. If we want to build a full tolerant quantum computer, the idea is that we may be able to use many physical qubits to build a log better logical qubits. And here we wish to take a first step in that direction. In particular, we observe that there's a linear relation between an error and the possible uh, output state of, of a qubit if we don't do anything. And this makes sense. If there's no error, we just end up with uh, the original state. If the error is 100%, then we just flipped the qubit state. Um, we can do certain types to protect the information. In germanium, it turns out, as we mentioned, that the uh, relaxation rate can be very long. And so we're mainly concerned about phase errors. And so here we try to implement a quantum algorithm that can correct for these phase errors uh, by using ancillary qubits. Um, now this, this algorithm does not correct actually for any type of errors during the entire sequence, except it does error uh, where you see here the red line. 
So if we introduce a phase flip error with a probability p along that line there on one of the qubits, in principle we should be protected against single qubit errors if the algorithm works. And so it's working in a kind of a way of a majority vote where the Toffoli like gate then maps the quantum state back to the original qubit and doing this in such a way that it's resilient against single qubit errors. And here you see some results of that system and you see that, that it follows more or less the trend. It's showing a few things. First of all, uh, well, the quality is, is maybe not so high. This is related to two things. First of all, as in a majority vote, if we have just three qubits, then, then the significance is not so strong. So one thing to advance will be to implement the sequence on the larger system. Secondly, the algorithm itself has a limited impact because the real algorithm is rather long and, and doesn't correct for any of the errors during that part of the algorithm. However, we also can observe that there is a correspondence and actually a regime where the algorithm performs better if we take this into account than the classical algorithm. So it showcases that we can implement a quantum algorithm uh, on a semiconductor qubit system. So we could continue and focus on fault tolerant quantum computing. One possible idea and an interesting direction is also to ask the question, okay, maybe already in the near future, can we do already do something relevant with smaller qubit systems? And, and not to have this abundance that you may have in, in error correction. And in particular, since um, uh, germanium qubits are described by a Fermi Hubbard model and therefore a quantum mechanical system, it may make sense to not first try to convert this into some digital uh, quantum algorithm, but rather to try to simulate relevant physics directly. And so here you see a first demonstration of a quantum simulation uh, in germanium. And so the, uh, what we wish to study here is to observe the dynamics um, of four coupled spins. And in particular, we wish to study the resonant valent bonds theory developed by Phil Anderson uh, at the time to describe high disease superconductivity. And it turns out to be of relevance in physics and chemistry throughout. So how does this work? Um, well, dependent on the uh, exchange between the different spins, we may in a, end up in a scenario where we have a regime where we have singlet states, for example, between the horizontal pairs marked here by the red star. We could also end up in a regime uh, where we have uh, singlet states between the vertical pairs marked by the blue star. Right in the middle, we see there are two possible states. Uh, an S-wave state, uh, an entangled state between all the possible spins, as well as a D-wave state, which is a singlet state pairing uh, along a cross. So something we can observe by first performing, initializing into singlet states, and then suddenly turning on this exchange interaction to go in this regime where all the exchange interactions are equal, we can see this very uh, nice uh, observation of oscillations throughout. Uh, and these are um, the resonating valence bonds. Now it seems maybe like, like a small uh, experiment. It's good to understand that it's actually uh, based on quite a few advances. First of all, all the exchanges between the different uh, pairs need to be characterized and then need to be set to an equal point. And the one that's possible, it also needs to be able to pulse throughout and go from one to another regime. So it's already quite some elaborated experiment to get to this point. Um, you can also see that the quality of the decision is good. It's very clear that we see oscillations, but there's also a significant decay. Um, so in order to put this into context, to really start to focus on, on uh, questions like high disease superconductivity, what will be very interesting to uh, study then is if we can now perform this quantum simulation on a larger system and then observe the spin dynamics, spin dynamics there. However, I think it's very exciting to see that already now we can start to go in this direction. And it will be very curious to see whether quantum simulation or digital quantum computation will provide a faster route to providing a quantum advantage using semiconductor quantum technology. Mm -hmm.